Well, I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon to uh, the first spring symposium hosted by the Judith Herb College of Education here at the University of Toledo. As a college, as a university, we have begun to have really what we consider to be really important conversations about issues of social justice, diversity, and inclusion. And we've turned to kind of the field of children and young adult literature as an impetus to think about how it is that we might engage each other, our students, in conversations that are sometimes difficult to have. We know we need to have these conversations, but we also know that they can be difficult. We see children's literature, young adult literature, as a place for us to kind of start some of these conversations. When we think about children's literature in particular, and maybe picture books in particular, we really mar can marvel at how authors and illustrators bring together language in words and the language of illustration to help us understand ourselves, each other, in deeper and certainly important ways. This afternoon, we are thrilled to have with us um, Benjamin Sapp, who is the director of the Maza Museum at the University of Findlay. If you have not, I'm going to put in a commercial here, Ben. If you have not been to the Maza Museum or visited, even visited their website, um, I want to encourage you to do so. It is an amazing, amazing place. Um, and I'm going to actually leave it to Ben to tell us a little bit more about the museum. But I do want to say one thing. If you look at those books that are behind Ben, those are all real. And they are all leather bound copies of children's books. I, I'm marveling at that background, um, but I think that tells you a little bit about how immersed Ben Sapp is in the world of children's literature and in particular illustrations in children's literature. So Ben's going to help us think about some of these um, I, issues, ideas related to social justice, diversity and inclusion through the eyes of illustrations in children's literature. So, Ben, thank you. We are so glad that you're here. Um, I'm going to ask that anyone who has questions at any point along during Ben's presentation, that if you'll just put that question in the chat, um, my colleague Susanna Hapgood is monitoring that chat and um, will make sure that um, she draws Ben's attention to these questions. Um, so please feel free to put that in. You don't have to wait to put it in after Ben speaks. Um, when you think of it, write it in and, and we'll address it. So I'm going to mute myself, Ben, and let you uh, get started. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I would like to thank also Susanna and Josh uh, for their help um, in making today uh, a reality and the University of Toledo for this opportunity to share with you. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint at this time. Um, the University of Finley's Mazza Museum uh, started in 1982 uh, with four original works of art um, that were housed in the basement of our college library. And a man by the name of Dr. Jerry Mallett, who was a student of Herb Sandberg, which some of you might know from the University of Toledo. Um, 
Jerry's idea was that there should be a place that gives recognition to the artist or the illustrator of picture books. And so he met with Dr. August and Alita Mazza. They gave the seed money to start the collection and uh, their dream or goal in 1982 was if somehow we could acquire at least one new work of art a year, it would be a wonderful goal uh, that would that could be reached. Um, The, and I'll show you in just a moment, the four original works of art. The first one here uh, by Stephen Kellogg is a portfolio of his, it's an etching. Uh, it has his book characters, it has his children um, and uh, their home uh, represented here in this, in this particular etching. Um, the next one is a work of art by Peter Spear from his book, Rain, and while the watercolor was wet, Peter took a head of a straight pen and pulled the watercolor down to give you the rain effect that you see there. Um, it's interesting that back in 1980, in the early 80s, this little boy's boots and the yellow raincoat were a dark navy royal, or really a, a dark royal blue. Blue is the worst color to fade in watercolor, and so in our museum, um, we keep the lighting equivalent to 15 candle power, uh, use UV glass to try to keep this type of thing uh, from happening. This one by Ezra Jack Keats from Apartment 3 is, was our third work of art. And then the last one by Eric Carle, uh, The Mixed Up Chameleon. Uh, Eric later did our um, banner for when our building uh, here on campus in 1994 uh, was built uh, for where the museum is currently housed. Um, he did the uh, celebration banner for that. And then about 15 years ago, he came and he spent three days with us along with his director, Nick Clark. They uh, went back to Amherst um, and ended up building the Eric Carl Museum. Uh, some of you might have been there. Uh, it's a wonderful place. We share a lot of the same similarities. Um, in the end, there's some differences too, but the, the real framework is taking and, and appreciating art from picture books. Um, so that goal has been broken. Uh, today we have over 17,000 original works of art from artists from all over the world. And these are all original works where you can pick up the book that goes around our museum and see the original hanging uh, up above. And um, it's a very special resource. Uh, it's um, very much uh, appreciated and used on our college campus. Um, what we do is when the artists come in, we videotape them talking about themselves and about the work of art that they created that we have in our possession. Um, and then as you walk around the museum, you can listen to them tell you about themselves and the artwork that you're looking at versus having myself or one of our docents. Uh, last semester, we had 29 university courses that use the museum as part of their coursework. One that I'm most excited about is the School of uh, Occupational Therapy. They're using children's literature to take Alzheimer's and dementia patients back to a time that they can remember. And then our art students are helping them to recreate that memory on paper. And then we have those works of art that they created on display here just outside the museum doors. Um, I tell you, it is so powerful to see the families come and to stand there and to just appreciate this um, sense of coping and this sense of helping their parent um, deal with this, this major health issue uh, in their life. So on a normal year, we would have uh, a, a bit over 5,000 school uh, children led tours. Of course, this past year has been one that we, I think we all would like to forget and can't wait to get back to having school children come through our doors um, generally, on a given year, we have 21 different visiting artists and authors that are here to speak and would encourage you to come and to be a part of that from conferences uh, to Sunday afternoon events to um, I'll talk at the end a little bit about our study tour where we travel to the homes and studios of our artists 
um, about every other year to a different part of the country to see where they work, how they work, what inspires them. And that is a real uh, wonderful resource. We generally take about 56 people uh, with us from teachers, librarians, uh, docents, students, and we would welcome uh, any of you that might have interest there. A lot of volunteers uh, last year, normal year, we had over 6,000 volunteer hours that helped with our many uh, programs that we provide. Uh, and there's about 47 different educational programs um, that make up the museum. Uh, last year, those 47 programs were done 291 times. So um, it, it's a busy place and uh, it's a wonderful place to share this wonderful resource to those that love literature and, and the art from picture books. So the illustrations and in inclusiveness over the years, um, Ashley Bryan um, is a dear friend. Um, he lives on Cranberry Island off the coast of Maine. And he said uh, to me, he said that it means a lot that we begin to recognize the ways in which we are very similar, maybe described differently, but the heart of it is that we are all human. And I think if we can look at that as we go through our days and look at literature and to sharing it with, with young people, that is something um, that we we need to keep with us. Um, back in the 60s, this by Bob Childress um, is probably what most of us refer to in our thinking and our thoughts of, of children's literature. And then two years later, um, there was this book that came out, uh, The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats, in 1962, which ended up winning a Caldecott, which there was a lot of controversy because Ezra Zach Keats, he was one of the first four illustrators that we had in our collection that did the apartment three, a redheaded Irishman. Uh, so there was a little bit of resistance because he was not African American himself, but this was in my children's literature textbooks. It was shared that this was the first book to to portray black children in a non stereotypical way. Um, and so I took that information and we were uh, the founding director of the Maz Museum and myself. We were at the Women's Museum of the Arts in Washington, D.C. Several years ago, and they just so happened to have a an exhibit on illustration by African American females. So we stopped in and um, we saw this work of art by a lady by the name of Lois Melu Jones. Come to find out she was the last living artist of the Harlem Renaissance, um, was doing works back in the 1930s. This little boy wants to grow up to be a doctor like his father. This young man here wants to grow up to be a lawyer like his father. So it was unheard of really to have black families living in an upper to middle class setting back in the 30s. Um, and so she would win top award in art shows until they found out that she was the artist, found out that she was black and that she was female. Um, she would use her male friends to get her art into shows and displays. And when they would find out that she was the artist, they would take those awards away. She went to France and studied for five years, um, was honored with a show of her own back in New York City. And when she came back, um, she uh, went to, to go into the, the gallery and a policeman stopped her and said, ma'am, I'm gonna have to escort you out. And on the way out, he says, I didn't think people of your race liked this kind of thing. And everything she had created or everything that was on display, she had created. Luckily, she lived long enough to receive the reward and the respect that she deserved. Um, she was the first honorary doctorate outside of commencement here at the University of Finley. Uh, she received the key to the city. She pulled me aside before she left and she said, Ben, what you do with the art here at the Mass Museum is, is where I want my art to be and, um, and what, it, what I want it to be used for. And so um, when she passed, uh, we received all of the picture book art uh, that she had created. 
For many years, she created in fine art. Um, we went to her home, which was an ex embassy in Washington, DC. We went three years in a row on her birthday and every year, uh, Jerry Mallet would ask her how old she was and she would tell him 90. Um, so I think she was about 94 when she ended up passing away. Um, but she was just filled with so much life and love of literature and art. When she came, she said, do you have a Dorothy Lathrop? And I said, we do, but it's a pencil drawing. And she said, that's what I want to see. Dorothy Lathrop was like a mentor to her. And if you go back and look at their illustrations, there's a lot of resemblance. Dorothy Lathrop was the first recipient of the Caldecott Medal. Um, and it's amazing to see how these two ladies, their work, um, at times you can't tell one from the other. Um, and just, just wonderful individuals. One more little story about Lois. So she was living, her mother was living with her in Washington, D.C. When she was in France, she dated a man from Haiti. They went their separate ways um, many, many, many years ago. There was a knock at the door, but a few days before that, Lois's mother said to her, Lois, aren't you ever going to put your paints down and find a man and maybe get married? And Lois was perfectly fine uh, the, the way she was living. The knock on the door, it was this man from Haiti. He said, Lois, are you married? She said, no, within two weeks, they were married and spent the rest of their life together. So. So Pat Cummings, another African-American illustrator uh, lives in Brooklyn, and she says that what I'm trying to do is to make sure everyone is included in my illustrations. It's not a question of making books politically correct by making them multicultural. That is the reality, that you can stay in one place all your life and never see other cultures, but is not representative of the real world. Um, as Cosby, um, wonderful author illustrator that you've uh, have heard uh, earlier and, and will again, I think be a part of the panel this afternoon. Um, My hair is a garden. Um, is a story of a, a young girl that is taunted by her classmates and she takes refuge in her, her neighbor. Uh, and by using the beautiful garden in the backyard uh, as a metaphor, the neighbor instills in her that uh, healthy hair is not a chore, nor is it something to fear, but more importantly, that she learns that natural black hair is something that's beautiful. So. And then, uh, Eno, um, who is also a, a part of your conference today, um, looking at the, um, the thrill of spending the night in a museum is a capstone to the story which ultimately is about free speech and political progress and artistic uh, defiance. Um, and so this would be a wonderful resource to, to have as well. Um, Morris Micklewhite and the Tangerine Dress. Um, this is a, um, for me, it's a true story of one of my students here at the University of Finley um, had a first grade uh, boy that, um, wanted to start dressing and and acting like a girl in the first grade. And this book uh, has been a resource for that classroom uh, this entire year. And um, the idea that this little boy uh, found love in this dress back in the costume area of the classroom and um, the other uh, students say that, you know, you can't have a boy wearing a dress and going to the moon or riding in a spaceship. And so it's, it's truly a book about acceptance. And, um, I think that is what this inclusion is. Um, you know, every day that we, we live every day that we listen to the news, um, is filled with things that I feel that picture books truly if we can go back to the, what we find in these books it would help us on a day-to-day -day basis uh deal with some of the things that we hear uh daily in our news um the big umbrella um is um is the um kind of a a story um the idea by uh amy uh june bates 
is, is really a metaphor that uses the umbrella to uh, demonstrate how kindness and inclusion work. Um, that the umbrella is there by the door uh, with a smile. It's friendly, it likes to help, and on rainy days, it welcomes people of all colors, all races, uh, to provide shelter um, um, from the storms. So, and then Calvin can't fly. I, I'm, I'm sure each of us can name friends from grade school to common day to today's uh, world that we live in of friends like Calvin that can't fly, a bird that can't fly, or children or adults that can't do this or that, um, and how the other starlings help Calvin to fly. They basically carry Calvin, um, and he's getting worried because towards the end of the book, the things, the, the colors are starting to change. It's time to migrate, and um, how these other birds help him uh, to, to, to reach that uh, task. And then Hillary Rodham Clinton um, did a book illustrated by Marley Frazee, uh, Marla Frazee, and um, where it takes uh, a village. And this is where she focuses on the impact individuals and groups outside of family have, or for better or worse, on a child's well being and advocates a society which meets all of the child's needs. Um, this being off the inclusion kind of uh, line, but there, the illustrators that we've had in over the last 20 years, many of them have done illustrations for books by famous authors, famous um, musicians, um, movie actors and actresses or politicians. And I've often thought about doing a conference with just those illustrators where they tell their story of working with these famous people and uh, maybe someday that we can make that happen. But this is a lovely resource um, that goes along with the theme uh, of this conference. Last stop on Market Street, uh, one of Caldecott Honor. Um, this is a lovely warm picture book with a strong and commendable theme of intergenerational friendship, uh, building of community, finding beauty in unlikely places, you know, this last year that we've we've lived or made our way through this type of book, I feel is so important with recreating those intergenerational friendships, those the building of communities that have been somewhat put on hold and then finding beauty in unlikely places. That may be the part that we've done in the last year uh, in this COVID time that we've been in. Um, so it's, it's also talking about the value of helping the less fortunate uh, and how to grow up to be a good person, uh, which we hope uh, we instill in every young person uh, today. And then Kevin Hinkus. Kevin is a dear friend. Um, I wish we all could be like Kevin for a day or maybe a week or maybe a month or a year. Kevin to this day does not have a computer. Kevin does not have a cell phone. If you call Kevin, he will write you back a handwritten letter um, to your address, which is almost a lost art anymore. Um, but I love his work. Uh, this is a story um, called The Egg. It's a graphic novel for preschoolers about four eggs, one big surprise, and an unlikely friendship. Uh, one egg is blue, one is pink, and one is yellow, and one is green. And the yellow, pink, and blue eggs hatch with these chicks that come out, and the green one does not hatch. To where finally, at the towards the end of the book, you find out that what's inside that egg is a little alligator, for which they become friends. They sit on the back of this alligator as he swims through the water, and the friendship um, there is is very, very uh, special. Lovely um, by Jess Young um, is a it's a it's a probably one of my favorite books that I've have here in this PowerPoint in the sense that it is um, somewhat different than most books, but it's um, taught, for instance, there's a girl with one blue eye and one brown eye looks diff looks directly at the viewer, then comes a series of 
uh, illustrative plays on words. So the word black is next to a white woman wearing black clothes. On the facing page, the word white uh, uh, accompanies a white woman with, a white, with white hair. On other spreads, we see a tall woman walking a short dog. Um, opposite a short man walking a tall dog and a red haired girl with a fluffy cat opposite of a straight haired girl with a sleek snake. So um, it's, I think it does a lot for uh, us as teachers and as parents as, as uh, for those that are sharing um, illustrations and books uh, with young people. Um, this is a story that we've all read in some format or another, um, but it's a story of, of a dinosaur who um, wants to be a ballerina and can't find shoes to fit. And the idea is that that she should not be a ballerina. And it's uh, it's a story that uh, has been told many different ways in many different characters. Um, but this one is one that um, put smiles, warmth in hearts uh, throughout. This is how we don't, or this is how we do it, um, is a, um, the idea that while we play, while the play we do may be different um, from where we come from, there's a shared rhythm of the days uh, in the lives of these uh, children. And this is the world that we share is what unites us, uh, is kind of the concept um, from this book. Done in a, a, a somewhat of a different way, um, but I like the different cultures and the different, um, uh, the different rhythms, the different games, the different ways that we uh, spend our time and how we together unite um, into something very special. Strictly No Elephants is a story of a little boy um, who uh, one day at school, uh, there is the pet club day. And the pet club says that there are strictly no elephants allowed. Um, and uh, so it goes on to share about how um, the idea that um, elephants come in all shapes and sizes as do other pets and uh, this little creature should be allowed to be a part of um, this pet day at school. Um, the idea that it's a sweet story that captures the magic of friendship and the joy of having a pet, even if that pet is different, uh, just as having friends, um, we all are different and should be accepted uh, on whatever day it may be. Come With Me um, is a story uh, championing uh, the power of kindness, bravery, and friendship in the face of uncertainty. Uh, a lovely, lovely story. And then I Am Here is, um, is where we have three students from that are immigrants from uh, Guatemala, Korea, and Somalia, and they have trouble speaking and writing and sharing ideas in English in their new American school. And so it shows throughout the book how friends, they become friends with other students, teachers, parents in the community that help them to gain a sense of their, uh, of their new home, but not losing sense of their home country, their language, and their identity. And I think this particular book is one uh, that we all should have uh, as a reference uh, in our sharing. Family is a family is a family. Um, this is a, a, one of my favorites as well. Um, the idea that one has many step siblings, uh, another may have a new baby in the family. And as this young girl's classmates describe who they live with or who loves them, family takes very different shapes. They have very different sizes and every kind of relation the child realizes that as long as their family is full of caring people, um, it is, it's special, it's okay. Um, so, um, kind of following the circle of family and friends through the course of the day, and it, it goes from the morning through uh, nighttime, the book affirms the importance um, of things great and small in our world, 
from the tiniest shell on the beach to the warmth of the family connections in the wildest sunset sky. Uh, so it, it's a lovely, lovely book. Um, All the World um, is um, um, a wonderful story where um, you have all the world is here, it is there, and it's everywhere. All the world is right where you are now. And um, it's uh, where the quiet day at the playground turns into a boisterous park-wide adventure as one boy on one slide becomes two kids um, on a seesaw. Um, and so, I'm so sorry, let me jump back. Um, this particular one, of course, won the Caldecott Honor but it's beautiful illustrations by Marla Frazee. Uh, she has done so many books that really truly um, illustrate the inclusion and uh, acceptance um, in the entire world, the entire city, the entire space in which um, we live. Uh, and the, I just love her illustrations in this particular book. This one, How to Two, um, is um, the, this is the one where we have a quiet day at the playground that turns into a boisterous park wide adventure as one boy on the slide becomes two kids on the seesaw and then three jumping rope before long. You have 10 friends that are playing, um, like they've known each other forever. It's a playful counting and reverse counting concept booked as well as a celebration of inclusive play friendship and community. We Are America um, by Walter Dean Myers and Christopher Myers. It's a father-son team, um, which doesn't happen a lot in the world of writing and illustrating um, in the sense that most times um, an author will write a manuscript, send it to the publishing house, and then they choose who they feel best fits uh, to illustrate the book. And sometimes, in many cases, the author and the illustrator will never meet until after a book is completed. Um, it's always very interesting to hear the stories between a father and son, mother, daughter, father, daughter that are working on books together. Um, as you know, there are, are husband and wife author illustrators that sometimes will start an illustration and have the other spouse finish that illustration. Um, I'm not sure many relationships would stand that kind of test, but um, there are many that it works very, very well. Um, but this is one um, where we have um, just a, the idea that America has struggles. We have ideals. We hope that we can live up to, to what those ideals are. This also touches base on what it does it mean to be an American. Uh, to live in a strange and beautiful land of complexity. Um, and so uh, it too is a wonderful resource that I think uh, could be utilized many times in a classroom in the course of a year. Love is powerful. Uh, this is a reflection of the women's march back in January of 2017 of a little girl that wanted her voice to be heard. And so she the story starts with her making a sign um, that she is going to share and to share her voice with the world uh, on this march with her mother. Uh, Can You Say Peace um, is celebrating the International Peace Day, which takes place every September on the 21st. And on this day and every day throughout the year, children all over the world can wish for peace. This particular book uh, teaches them how to say the word, um, how to the concept of peace and how to say it in 22 different languages, uh, which is, is very unique. Uh, Why I Am Me um, is a story of uh, where children or asking children if they've ever wondered why you are you um, or who you would be if you were someone else, um, someone taller, faster, smaller, smarter, someone lighter, older, darker, bolder. 
um, to imagine a world where there is no you or me, but only we is um, is the hope that you get from from this story. Um, this particular book, uh, All Are Welcome, is a warm and welcoming picture book that celebrates diversity and gives encouragement and support uh, to all kids. It's where we follow a group of children through their day at school and where everyone is welcomed with wide open arms. Um, you have kids coming in various um, clothing from different countries and different um, multicultural uh, backgrounds. And again, everyone is accepted and welcomed um, as friends. This one, I can't help to put a smile on my face when I look at it. Peter Reynolds, uh, a wonderful illustrator, um, but be you. Um, he um, says that in this particular book um, and in his words is that be your own work of art. Um, and in, in doing that, we need to accept each other and each of us being our own work of art. Um, which is is very, very special. And then each kindness is a um, story um, by Jacqueline Woodson illustrated by Evie Lewis. Uh, we just acquired a work of art from this particular book and we're very honored to have it. Um, it's a lesson where um, a child um, misses the chance to become close to another uh, a girl a girl named Chloe doesn't really know why she turns away from a new girl called Maya to where eventually Maya leaves the classroom and Chloe wishes she would have been kind and accepting uh, to this new girl and um, it's a, a lovely story heartfelt I love Evie's illustrations and again, really tying together um, the acceptance and the inclusion um, that we hope to and we strive for uh, in all of our relationships. Um, Jerry Pinckney um, shared this with me. He said, I want you to know that the illustrations that I paint reflect African-Americans, but I see we all have the same feelings. We have the depths of emotions that's American experience where we deal with people that might be different than oneself, but we all have many of the same things in common. The Maz Museum is a place for everyone. Um, one of our docents um, that oftentimes get a little nervous about giving tours would be preschool children. And another group would be junior high kids uh, a, a year or so ago. We had a. A tour for 6th graders and trying to get them to take into consideration that college, if that's something for them is not that far away. And they were able to pick 3 parts of our campus to explore on this day and the Maz museum was 1 of those. This young man um, has autism had a teacher's aide with him. He could tell you more about Rosemary Wells than he could tell you than than she could tell you about herself. Um, he said to his teacher's aide that he was not going to the other two sessions. He was going to spend the whole day here looking at her artwork. And later that afternoon, I sent her an email to say, Rosemary, it's amazing the impact you have on this young man. Two and a half weeks later in the mail came an original illustration from one of her Max and Ruby books autographed to him. I called the principal and I said, Don, I said, how can we get this to this young man? And Don says, well, in two weeks, we have an all academic assembly that um, we would, we could give this to him for, because he would not normally be going to the auditorium because of the, the large audience. Um, but his parents were there. He came up on stage. He accepted the work of art, embraced it in his arms. And, and then uh, two months later, Rosemary was in Cincinnati and we took him and his mom and a group of students from the University of Finley down to see, hear her speak. And it was just something so very, very special. Uh, so. 
Um, again, the study tour, we'd love to have you join us. We visit um, many, many different illustrators, uh, uh, generally about 26 every time we take a study tour to visit our authors and illustrators in their homes and studios. Um, our conferences, we have one this summer, July 12th and 14th, it'll be virtual. Um, here are the authors and illustrators that will be presenting uh, those three days. And then we have, fingers crossed, one in person, November 12th and 13th. Um, and there will be six different author illustrators uh, for that event. We have Young Artists Workshop for Children. Uh, we uh, last year did this in a virtual format um, and um, it's just a wonderful uh, resource for the children. They create their own picture books uh, and then at the end of the week, the parents walk around and the, the students sign and autograph uh, slips of paper as if they were uh, authors and illustrators uh, in, in real life. We have Fun Day Sunday. It's, a, uh, it's a, an event for families uh, where we have, we turn this entire building into an art and literature fair. And you have generally about five to 600 people here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and we look forward to that uh, getting back to normal someday soon. Uh, Tales for Tots is a story time for preschool children using music, art, and literature. And then um, this is uh, kind of a, a, a final quote by Ashley Bryan. Um, he says, the artist is not a special kind of person. Every person is a special kind of artist in our world today. Wow. Um, that, that's my initial reaction is, wow. Um, you are a wealth of information, Ben, um, on, on so many different things. Um, I guess I have an observation and then I'm thinking, Susanna, you may have some things and please anybody else who has any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm struck by two of the slides that you showed. One was um, what I'll call the Dick and Jane slide. I am of an age where that's how I learned to read was reading Dick and Jane. And then I'm kind of fast forward to the slide near the end on all are welcome. And I looked at the pictures and the faces of the children in that in that cover. And I'm struck by, um, from my perspective, how far we've come. Um, and really putting my, trying to put myself um, in which I can't do, but uh, just thinking about how many children for the longest time didn't see their families represented in the illustrations of picture books. And, and it, I'm hopeful that that's something that has a thing of the past. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that. Ben, you're muted. So I, th I thank you for that, um, those thoughts. We, we currently have a work of art is in our, what we call book dummy um, uh, exhibit right now, where Aliki Brandenburg back in 1984 um, did an illustration, uh, uh, did the entire book, uh, had illustrated it, was ready to go to print. It was called Party, um, Party time, party again. I, I'm sorry, the tight exact title. But party is major part of of the title. And at the last minute, it was going to print. At the last minute, the publisher called her and said, "Aliki, we we would like you to change the nationality from Asian, an Asian family, to a white family because it will sell more." So that and those words we have from the publisher that she gave us. So, you know, I feel like we've come a long way since 1960, 
when you know the Dick and Jane was being created in 1984 we're moving in that direction but we we still to this day we have a lot of room to improve um, but I think by you having conferences like this by authors and illustrators sharing their work um, and trying to make uh, inclusion a part of 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 a part of their uh, their books, their message, and their illustrations um, only help us to meet that uh, that need that we we truly have in this world. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just struck with such a human experience, you know, and the a theme that seems to run throughout many of the books that you shared with us today is about uh, a shared humanity. We, we, we all have hurts and joys and, um, but then there's the particularity of our heritage and our families and our traditions. And those are also part of that human experience. We can be the same and different simultaneously. Right. Um, and, and, and I, I know that the the world I think at times has too many critics. Um, uh, I I would I would be hopeful and mindful that we allow people to create um, as long as it is what's being shared is factual, is accepting uh, of the culture and the lives of the people that is being that are being represented. At the end of the day, I myself feel like any of us can be telling a story as long it is, as it is factual Actually. and is helping us to come together as a community and as a country and as a world. Um, it shouldn't matter the color of skin of who's writing the story or illustrating the story as long as it's being done properly and well. Um, it, I just, I just hope that we all can be accepting uh, in so many new and, and better ways um, today. And I think Susanna there, I'm sorry. It, it seems to me that there's kind of a, um, we have to do two things at the same time, celebrate who we are and our stories and how we are in fact different from each other. Right. And at the same time, also look for those places where we come together. That's that's what your comments were making me think, Susanna. Right. Being being open being to to uh, learning about others and and deepening our own um, even questioning of our own selves. Mm -hmm. And learning how to question what we may take for granted or assume. Um, you know, I think of the Phantom Toll Booth, which is a book that has influenced my life greatly. You know, never, never wanting to leap to the island of assumptions, but we do so quickly often leap to assumptions, and uh, you have to take take care to recognize when we do that. Um, tricky. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I do have a question for you, Ben, which is something I've wondered about a little bit with illustrators and and writers. I know that often they never meet one another, but if a author has written a book and it's, it's based, it seems to be clearly based around um, a child's experience, but the illustrator decides to use animals in the illustrations. Have you ever had conversations with the writers and the illustrators around, you know, the use of animals in children's picture books? Yeah, we, matter of fact, we just, so since COVID, we've been doing what we call Math Artist Monthly. And um, we just had um, Harry Bliss, who did a book uh, and decided to use animals and it was primarily um, 
he said that um, part of the reason was he didn't have to worry about the politicalness of cultures or male, female, and trying to make all of that please the critics. Um, and, 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 and sometimes we have the simpleness of them just saying, it's a lot easier to draw an animal than it is a person uh, or to paint. But those were his words. And um, I, think, I think we all are a bit more sensitive right now um, in that political realm. And um, that was something that his publisher was was totally fine with um, was to utilize um, animals as the characters instead of people. So. Susanna and I had the good fortune of uh, working with Harry at a Sandberg Institute a few years ago. So. Uh, very interesting well, talented well and with his work with for the new yorker i mean he um i i feel like we're honored humbled to to that he gives a time of himself to do picture books because um i i look at it as almost a hobby to him um his real a lot of his work is is done uh in other formats so absolutely well, there's so much more that we could delve into and talk about and go back and look at all of the illustrations that are that are inside those books and, and think together about that. But unfortunately, we don't have time to do that right now. But but Ben, we thank you um, for helping us think about not just the illustrations, but certainly the illustrations um, and the ways in which this field of children's literature is, um, as you said, making strides in making sure that all children have the opportunity to see themselves in the books that they read. Um, we're not there yet. Um, but I'm hopeful that we're getting closer or at least making progress. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for our um, participants who were here with us today. We appreciate uh, your being here. We have one more session for today um, that will bring together um, our distinguished panel that will include Ben Sapp. It will include um, Inosanto Nagara and Cosby Cabrera, um, our authors and illustrators with whom we've spoken earlier this morning, as well as um, Mike Deach, who is the Director of Education from the Toledo Museum of Art, and um, Dr. Heidi Apple. Um, the Dean of our Honors College here, who has um, been very instrumental in uh, helping a lot of people at the university and beyond think about visual literacy, which we think kind of ties right in with this notion of the stories that we have to tell, both with words and pictures. So thank you all, and uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at four o'clock this afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.